And I've got to be honest with everyone, uh, this service could have been a whole different type of service if that would have been up to Gerald Hagerman here tonight. Uh, so he walked out of the Welcome Center, and he walked out, and he just saw a Bible. See, Gerald has a Bible. He got, Gerald got me this Bible, so it's pretty special to me, but it's all bound up just like his. And he walks out, and I think he just assumed it was his, and he just grabs the Bible off of the table and begins to walk away. I'm nowhere around my Bible, and Laura, my beautiful, wonderful daughter who wants me to succeed in life, <laughs> looks across and goes, um, excuse me, is that yours? In which Gerald replied, yes, that's mine. And she goes, Grandpa, is that your Bible? No, it is not. And he set it back down. And then he told Lori, he's like, but how funny would it have been if I would have walked off with your dad's Bible? You want to see someone lose his mind? If that happens 10 minutes before he has to go up there and teach, that would be it. But luckily, here it is, and so we're good to go. So if you have your Bibles, which I have mine, praise the Lord, he is good to me. Let's open it up to uh, Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32. So we've been going through the book of Genesis, and we've been looking at the life of Jacob. And we've been looking at he, as he was fleeing from Laban. See, Laban's countenance had changed towards him. And we knew it had changed because the, the word for countenance is actually um, his, his face or his person had begun to, to, to change towards him in a negative way as God chose to bless Jacob, regardless of how many times Laban tried to change his wages. See, Jacob has changed his life ever since he had this dream where God had finished by saying, I will always be with you. From that point on, Jacob was very fair in all of his dealings. Jacob worked and, and worked hard for Laban for numerous, numerous years, being cheated and having his wages being tried to be changed, and yet God continued to take care of him and continued to take care of him until the time came where God told him, it's time for you to return back home, and uh, you know Laban's countenance towards you has changed, and so it's time, and I will be with you, and that was enough for him to leave. And so as he's leaving, unbeknownst to him, Rachel begins to grab uh, the little mini gods from um, her, uh, her dad, Laban, and, uh, which, we, which we know are called teraphim. And Laban uh, basically caught up in the last chapter, caught up to Jacob and began to overtake him. But before he could do what he wanted to do to him, the Lord had spoke to Laban and said this to him, be careful that how you speak to Jacob, neither good nor bad. And we looked as, as he took him over, there's nothing that could come against Jacob. The Lord allows things to happen, but the Lord also doesn't allow things to happen. And this, Jacob uh, was sitting there talking to Laban, and Laban said these words. He says, it is in my power to do you harm. And in that terms, I don't think it is, because there had been many a times where Laban had tried to do harm to Jacob, and it didn't work. And here, he gets a warning, a stern warning from God. Be careful how you speak to him. It's the same way as you're doing work for the Lord, as you do things for the Lord, as God's anointed. Listen, we have to be careful how we speak to one another, but as you're doing the work of the Lord, don't worry how people speak against you. You should be more worried about them and what, what God is doing. Because the truth is, God is going to continue to move you uh, forward, but long story short, uh, as, as he begins to freak out about these teraphim and these little gods, he begins to realize he can't find anything, and he couldn't find anything in any of the tents um, because Rachel had taken them and put them on the camel. And uh, she, they were on there, and she basically was like, yeah, I'm not getting off for numerous reasons, which we don't have to go into right now. But she wasn't going to get off the camel, and he was fine with that. But it was so weird because Jacob uh, just wanted to show how, how right he was before him. And he said, I didn't take any. In fact, the whole reason I left you was because I thought that you would never send me away. Good. You, never, you were going to take my daughters. I mean, you're going to take your daughters, take my wives away. And, and he goes, and whoever took your gods, go ahead and kill them. It's one of those things like where you should just stop talking while you're ahead, right? And uh, he had no clue 
that it was Rachel. Luckily, the Lord protected Rachel, and he never found his gods. But we ended on Jacob and Laban making a covenant. They began to talk to one another that neither one of them would harm one another. Because what had happened was Jacob was managed to say all the ways that he was fair. How he was fair to Laban. There were so many things that were going on in, in, their, in their life that Jacob was like, listen, I've never ripped you off. I have no accountability out here by myself, and I've never stolen from you, and I've worked hard for you. Whether it was rain, sleet, shine, hail, it doesn't matter. I continually worked for you. I took the losses upon myself. And so at that point, Laban's like, okay, let's make a covenant. And they made a covenant that neither one of them would cross over to harm one another. And we saw that Laban was able to bless and kiss his daughters and his grandchildren and the whole thing, and then he returned home. I think it's so strange. Laban is an interesting character, and we're not going to talk about him again, but he's just an interesting character in, in, this, in this story because in one, in one part of the story, he's wanting to kill whoever has his teraphim, and the first people's tense that he checked was his daughters, so he would have killed his daughters, and the next he's going, well, let's make a covenant so we can't hurt one another. It's a man that's focused on himself as opposed to a man that's focused on the Lord and what God's going to do. And so tonight, as we begin the new, the new part of the chapter in chapter 32, we're going to look at a man by the name of Esau. His name comes back up. Do we all remember Esau? All right, well, let's go ahead and look at it then. Genesis 32, 1 through the rest of the chapter. It says, so Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp, and he called it, uh, the, uh, the name of that place Manahem. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants. And I have sent to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. Then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is also coming to meet you, and with 400 men there with him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him, and the flocks, and the herds, and the camels, and the two companies. And he said, If Esau comes, the one company, and attacks it, then the other company which is left can escape. Then Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all your mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over the Jordan with my staff and now I have two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children." For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for the multitude. So he lodged there that same night and, he uh, and took what he came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls. 20 uh, female donkeys and 10 foals. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servant, servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance between the successive droves. And he commanded the first one, saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks, saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Whose are these that are in front of you? Then you shall say to him, they are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my Lord Esau, and behold, he also is behind us. So he commanded the second and the third, and all who followed the drove, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And also, behold your servant Jacob, he is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterwards, and I will see his face. Perhaps he will then accept me. So the present went on before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the fort of Jabbok. Then he took them, sent them over the brook, and uh, sent over what he had had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks." But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said that my name is Jacob. 
And he said, your name is no longer called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men, and you've prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him, and he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, uh, for I have seen God's face to face, and my life has been preserved. And just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the scripture, Lord, that we will be looking at tonight, Lord, as we begin to just, um, just dissect your word. And, and Lord, we just thank you, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, would you just... Would you just come here right now, Lord? Would you just send your Holy Spirit to minister to every single one of us in here, regardless, uh, Lord God, if, if we have known you for many years, Lord God, and we're just here ready to grow more in you, or whether we're brand new Christians in you, Lord God. Would you just become these things to us that we need, Lord, the sweet milk, but also the meat of the word, Lord? That's something that only your spirit can do. Not my words, Lord God, but only your word. So, Lord Jesus, teach us tonight as, as we're your sons and your daughters. We're gathered here together. And we, Lord, we just pray that this word would go out with power, Lord God. And so, Lord, we also know that as we gather together, Lord God, we know that the enemy likes to come against us and likes to attack the people that are sitting in here with shame and condemnation and depression and anxiety and worry and doubt and fear and all these things, Lord. It seems like sometimes right when we sit to, to get calm and quiet before you, he attacks us. So, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray it leaves in your beautiful son's name, Jesus. And Lord, it is just an awesome time, Lord, of your spirit speaking to spirit. So Lord God, move in this room, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at verses one through two together as we begin to dissect this. It says, so Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Manaim. Now, this is an amazing part of scripture. And if I was to be like Gerald, this would be the part where I seem like I continue to hit home time and time and time again. For Pastor Gerald, if you haven't been attending Daniel, then you have not had this here. For there is a God in heaven because he has you repeat it over and over and over again because it has been a theme for the book of Daniel. But for us, as we've been going through Genesis, the, the story of Jacob and God telling him that I will always be with you as he told his father, as he told his grandfather, the truth was is he promised that I will always be with you. And now we see an amazing display of the love and care that God has for Jacob. Whenever we see angels mentioned in the Bible, see, we see him coming and we see that he sees these camps and that word Manahim means double camp. So he sees another camp here, and whenever we see the angels in, angels in the Bible, it's always uh, in the form of man. So it kind of makes you wonder how he recognized right away that this was a camp of angels. We don't fully understand. Either way, it doesn't really matter. It makes you wonder if they're in the same appearance as man or if they were in some other appearance. But either way, it was amazing to me that as he's going, that there is his camp, but then there's God's camp all around him. Is that not amazing? God has told him over and over and over again that I will be with you, I will be with you, I will be with you. And now God shows him as he's gonna be the most scared that I think he's been in his life, that God is with him. And my personal opinion, church, and, and this is one of those things that I, I know to be true, is this is not the first time, this is not the first time that these angels had been with him. This is the first time that he could see them but Jacob's whole life, these angels were with him. These angels would go before him. These angels, he walked into it and saw the camp of angels. Listen, the truth is, as Christians, as believers, God, I mean, we know that we don't battle against flesh and blood, amen? There's angels right now with us. It says, Psalms 34, 6 through 7, says, This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps uh, around all that fear him, and he delivers them. Matthew 18, 10, Jesus said this. He said, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. Now listen, for I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. For the son of man has come to save that which was lost. It's just amazing. Whenever I pray before I, I, I come in here and I'm like, Lord, I just pray that you would just be here. It is just an awesome reminder that 
we are not alone. Even with how crazy the world can seem, no matter how big your problems can seem, the, the God that we serve is so much bigger. The God of many armies, the God with angelic armies is for you and he is with you. I love it because every night I go home and, and every night I pray for both of my daughters individually and I have separate prayers that I pray for them. And as I pray for them, I set them down. I'm always like, and, and, and I just always say, Lord, and I just pray you just surround her with your angels as she sleeps. And Lord, I thank you so much that you love her so much. In Jesus' name, amen. And I lay them down. But it's just such an awesome reminder that even while I'm sleeping, God's at watch, amen. God's in control even when we're not completely all there so they sleep. <clears throat> Verses three through five says this. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants. And I have sent to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. Do you see what Jacob is doing here? Does everyone recognize what he's doing with these messengers he's sending out? He's putting his feelers out to Esau, right? I mean, he remembers where he left Esau and what Esau had said, you know? He basically, he's like, hey, hey, uh, you messengers, I want you to go say this. Tell them that I've been with Uncle Laban for a while. I left kind of poor, but now I have acquired a lot of things, okay? Make sure you let him know I'm rich. Make sure you let him know I got some things. And then ask him this, on a scale from one to want to kill me, where do we lay in there still? Do you still want to kill me? Because remember the last time we left, Esau was ready to kill Jacob for stealing the, the family blessing. Something that already belonged to Jacob, Jacob still rushed the hand and went and stole it. And so he spent the last 20 years in, 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 in you know, basically, the circumstance he made for himself, but God has taught him and grown him and done an amazing work in him. But we know too that Esau, last time we saw him, he was weeping bitterly, like dirty, like gross crying, you know? Just, just anger and frustration and, you know, just screaming. And as soon as dad dies, you're toast, Jacob. That was basically what he said. So now, now Jacob's sending messengers out like, hey, have you cooled down yet, you know? I mean, you have to be scared if you're gonna call your own brother Lord, right? Ask my Lord if he, how, is he, how, he's, how he's doing here. Verse six, then the messengers returned. Okay, great, the messengers are back. They returned to Jacob and they said, we came to your brother Esau and he's also coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. I'll guarantee you, out of all the things he, he wished they would have said, that was not one of them. He did not want them to be looking for him, and especially that there would be 400 men with him. What this spells for Jacob is a bad day in his mind. Man, I, I'll, I remember when I was young, and just, just whenever I would be disobedient to my mom, and I felt like I could get away with it the minute she said these words. Just wait till your dad gets home. It ruined my day until my dad came home and I just accepted the punishment that was coming. Right? I had like little kid anxiety, right? Or if like my teacher said, you know what? You've been talking too much in class. Go figure. Uh, you've been talking too much in class. I'm going to call your parents. You're like, I am in so much trouble when I get home. I can't imagine stealing the blessing from your brother, the thing that he wanted more than anything in the world. He didn't care about the spiritual side of things, but he definitely wanted the riches. He definitely wanted, uh, he definitely wanted the blessing, and you stole it from him. And now uh, he's bringing 400 people to come meet you. And the last thing you heard from him is, yeah, you guys should probably leave because he's going to kill you. So Jacob devises a plan. Here we go, seven through eight. So Jacob was greatly afraid, obviously, and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him, and the flocks, and the herds, and the camels, and he divided them into two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. Basically what he's doing here is he's letting his past failures terrify him so much that he, he's living in the what could happens of life. 
He doesn't know for sure what his brother's going to do, but he is greatly, greatly afraid of that meeting with him. And so what happens when we're afraid of something that could happen? Like I said, when I was a child and I knew my dad was coming home, those times where I was afraid of him coming home, there's a good half those times he did nothing. He didn't get upset. He talked to me about it, and it was not near as bad as I thought. But when we have this kind of idea that we did something wrong, your mind automatically goes to, I'm assuming the worst. And so to assume the worst, he made sure that he didn't completely die. Everything he didn't have completely die. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take our one big camp, split it into two camps, so when him and his 400 people come, they'll destroy one of us, and whichever one lives, we run the opposite direction. Can we all disagree that, that Jacob, as he, I, I just kind of feel bad for him because he's been, he's been, you know, he's had these consequences to sin in his life for a very, very long time, and he's lived with it, and, and the shame of it, and all those things that he has dwelling inside of his heart, and, and we have to admit, though, Jacob is not the same person as he used to be. God is at work in him, and he's changing a lot. Now, we know here just a little bit, God's going to continue to work things out of him, and there could be real consequences to our sin, but man, you have to realize in our life that if God has called you to something, you can't be held back by who you once were. Do you understand? You can't be worried about your future. You, know, you can't be worried about the future that you have because you're so scared of your past. You can't change the past. What's happened has happened. Who you were before you came to Christ does not dictate who you are now in Christ. You can only live today in who you are in Christ and trust in God that he is redeeming all things in your life, even the worst things that you have ever done, and you cannot be afraid to move forward in life because here's the truth. The enemy loves it when you're afraid to move forward in life because he gets this little foothold in your heart, and he wants to cripple you, so he screams shame, condemnation, condemnation and judgment to you. He continues to scream it in your ears till you're crippled and you don't want to move forward for the Lord. I'd rather just live quietly in my house and I never want to share the gospel with anyone because they might put back in my face who I used to be. Move forward in the Lord. You cannot give him that foothold. It says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And you have to love Philippians 1, uh, 3, 3, 13 says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. You have to forget your past and who you once were and claim your identity in Christ. Give it to Jesus. Leave your past sin where it lies in the past and move forward. We know the story in Matthew 14, 22 through 33. It's a famous Bible story. It's a true story. It says, now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, phantasma. Actually, they, yeah, it is a ghost. Uh, and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down off the boat, he walked on water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and he began to sink and cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Listen, today God is in control of the sea. God is in control of the storm. God is in control of that water. God is in control of your problems. God is in control of your past mistakes. You need to move forward forward. One thing I love about Peter is he's the guy that got off the boat, right? He's the guy that was like, I'll get off the boat. I have enough faith to step on water. I have enough faith to walk on water. The problem was is when he started to look at the problems around him. You've heard this taught many a times, but it always cracks me up because he thought that maybe, you know, this thing here was impossible, even though the simple fact that he is standing on water is impossible, but that boisterous wave right there, that thing is impossible. I haven't learned that level yet. And when he began to lose his faith that he was not going to stand on water, he began to sink, and the Lord saved him. Churches, will you begin to look at your surroundings and who you were in your past, and you're going to make a lot of decisions that don't make a lot of sense unless you focus on what the Lord has for you. 
is you automatically assume the worst of what's going to happen to you. You're limiting yourself on what God's going to do through you. Verses 9 through 12, look at this. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, uh, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of the mercies and the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I have two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother, uh, and the mother with the children. Man, we saw him just seconds ago and he was greatly afraid and distressed. And it doesn't say how much time went by before he started to pray, but we know that a lot of times we carry around our distress and our problems and our anxieties and our fears much longer than we should. This word afraid is not what we even give it credit for because afraid for me, I'm afraid of spiders, okay? I do not like spiders, but I also know I can smash them with my shoes so it's not that big of a deal. But this word for afraid is terror and fright. Do you understand that he knows that there's nothing he can do to fix this? He downright stole the most important thing to Esau. And I guarantee you, he had that, te that terror and that fright and that worry for a while. But look what finally happens right here. He calms down. He calms down, and what does he do? He goes to God. He prays to the Lord. And I think this prayer is very important because I believe it holds key points to who we are as Christians and how we should pray to the Lord. I believe it holds keys, and I underlined each one of these because it's so important as we look at this prayer. The first thing that he says to God is he says, Oh, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac. This is a reminder to him, and this should be a reminder to all of us when we go before the Lord who you are praying to. Have great reverence and respect for the God that has done many great things in your life as well as your family's lives, as well as, you know, just carry on the generations, the God of the Bible, the God of our lives, the God of Abraham, Isaac, the God of Jacob. We serve that same God and there's great reverence in reminding yourself who he is. It's a renewing faith that, listen, if God didn't let me down before, there's no way he's going to let me down now. Here he's saying, you're the God of my father Abraham. You're the God of my father Isaac. Listen, both those guys had major problems in their life, but yet God continued to pull them through rough times as they continued to have faith in God. And he says this, he says, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal with you. He's recognizing the call of the Lord on his life. He's basically saying, Lord, you know the only reason that I'm going to this place is because you told me to. You told me to return to your country. You told me to return to your family and that you will deal well with me. I'm being obedient, Lord. Please come through. Please, please do something awesome. Reminding God of his promise. And then look at this. This is my favorite part of the prayer. I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I have two companies. Coming to the Lord where we should all be. As we approach God with reverence, as we're telling the Lord about, Lord, this is the promise that you gave me, humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord, amen? <laughs> Humble yourself in complete humility. I love how low he lowers himself. He's like, listen, I'm not deserving of your mercies. I'm not deserving of the truth that you've given me. You have blessed me so radically. Before I came here, I had a stick. Think about that. I came here with my staff. I literally had a stick, and now I have two companies. Well, it's actually technically one big company, but Lord, you know how I split it into two. So one or two. It's big is what I'm trying to say, Lord. It's a lot of things you've blessed me with. That's what he's doing to the Lord right now. Because in Philippians 4, 6, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in prayer and supplication. What's the key? With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. But you go to the Lord before the request with thanksgiving. Lord, you are amazing. You are powerful. You have done so many things because church, no matter what problem you're having in your life, no matter how bad you think things have gotten, has God not been so good to you? Has God not blessed you in so many ways? 
He is deserving of our praise even if you are sad, even if you are joyful and happy. He is deserving of your praise equally. And the next one, he says this. Now he's giving his request. He says, deliver me, I pray, for the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother, of the, uh, of, of the mother with the children. This is the request. I am terrified. I am terrified and you need to control the situation. Man, God wants you to bring up things that trouble you. He wants your honesty. He, he, he understands. We, we serve a God that can sympathize with your weaknesses. He understands if you're saying, I don't understand. I, I, I'm super, I, I'm terrified by the thing that's facing me outside of these walls right now. And then there's other people on their spiritual high horses somewhere that are like, listen, I never pray for myself. I refuse to pray for anything about myself. When I pray, I only give the Lord other people's requests. I never pray for myself. And you're like, well, they're Mr. Holy. Because here's the truth. Jesus prayed for himself. God wants to hear us pray for the things that are bothering us. God wants to hear that on his lips. Listen, I love when my daughter comes to me with a list of wants. Listen, do I give her everything she wants? No. But do I give her the things she needs? Absolutely. And do I give her the things she wants most of the time? Yes, but she is perfect. So, <laughs> so but the, God's the same way with us. He gives us so many good things. But he also wants to hear every single thing that you have to say. Psalms 55, 22 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And it says here, it says, for you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for the multitude. He's submitting to the will of the Lord. And that's important. At the end of our prayer, Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. God, you are so good, you know more than I know, but this is what I would like to have happen. But Lord, at the end of the day, he's saying, this is what you've said is going to happen. And so that I'm going to stand on that promise and I'm going to believe it. I'm going to believe that promise that you said, I will surely treat you well. I will make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for the multitude. Jacob knows he can't change Esau's mind, but he's praying that God can. Listen, I know I can't change his mind, but Lord, can you please change his mind? And church, I have two questions as we pray to the Lord, and these are the questions I want to ask you. Amen. Is this the way that we pray? I mean, is it? Because a lot of the times, and I'm not talking about the short little prayers that you give, like, Lord, I pray for this sick person, but I'm talking about like you and the Lord. It, it, when you pray to the Lord, is there the reverence that you are boldly walking into the throne room of God by, by the blood of Jesus. I mean, do you really f understand what you're doing? You're walking in there boldly petitioning. You're walking in there giving glory and honor. Are you walking in there giving thanksgiving or are you just rattling off everything you want and then saying bye-bye on the way out the door? I encourage you to spend time with the Lord, preparing your heart, even before you even begin to speak of the things. Say, Lord, I thank you for everything. Lord, you are powerful and awesome and, and mighty, and you know all things. Oh, and by the way, I'm terrified of the guy who wants to kill me, right? Is that the way we pray when we're frantic? Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath like he did and allow yourself to pray to God. And the last question I want to ask you about this is, do you even pray to the Lord when you're frantic? Do you even pray to the Lord when terrifying times come? Be honest with yourself, because I'm going to be honest with you. There's a lot of people that just like to carry around their burden for some reason. There's a lot of people that just like to heap more burdens upon themselves and heap, you know, terrifying times upon themselves. And I'll tell you, when I hear something, there's a lot of times that I instantly try to go out and fix the problem. There, I should stop what I'm doing and say, let's give it to the Lord. But there's many a times I run in their head first like an idiot. I'm going to go fix everything. And then I make things way worse. And I come back. I'm like, Lord, fix everything. 
The very first step in a Christian's life when you find out something bad has happened or when you think something's going to happen or anything you do in life, you should walk to the Lord and say, God, I need you to intervene. Every Christian's reflex for, for major problems should be first to go to prayer. The first thing you do when you're full of fear, the first thing you do when you're, when you're having a troublesome time, go to God and surrender it to him. Look at verses 13 through 21. It says, so he lodged there that same night, and he took uh, what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother, 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, and 20 rams, 30 milk camels. I didn't know that there were milk camels, but now you do. With their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. And then he delivered uh, to them to the hand of the servants, every drove by itself. And he said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance between the successive drones, uh, droves, it's not drones, droves. And he commanded the first one saying, when Esau, my brother meets you and asks you saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Whose are these that are in front of you? Then you shall say, they are your servant Jacob's. It is a present and sent to my Lord Esau, and behold, he is behind us. So he commanded the second and the third, and then he followed the, uh, and all that followed the drove, saying, in this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him, and also say, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterwards, and I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present went over before him, and, uh, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. Do you see the plan that he is setting up here? He has a pretty good plan. And the plan would appeal to a lot of people in life. But he's going to take all these goods that he just named off, and there's a lot of them. He's going to take these goods, and he's going to put them into three droves. And he's going to have these servants deliver them to to, to Esau, one, one drove at a time, distance between them. So his idea is to lighten the blow until he sees Jacob. Right? That would work for some people, right? I mean, because we know that Esau didn't really care about the spiritual side of things. He more cared about the materialistic side of things anyways. So when you have one group come up and be like, hey, remember Jacob? Have some toys. You know, have some presents. Have some things. And he's like, ah, I still want to kill him. And then here comes another one. Hey, guy. Remember Jacob, the guy you wanted to kill? Do you want to kill him any less? Here, have some more stuff. You know, his goal was to have three droves of these, these, these presents and these gifts and everything that he's, as he's giving to him. And hopefully by the time that Jacob's there, he will forgive him and he will receive him. One thing I, I, we have to look at is that he did this in fear because there was a real fear in Esau's life. And realistically, he should have just met with his brother, trusted in God for the result. But we know in life, sometimes that's easier said than done. And so he wanted to show Esau that he was repentant. I do believe that Jacob had the right heart here. I want to show him that I've changed. I want to show him that I'm a different man than when I left 20 years ago. I mean, me 20 years ago, I would have left I would have went the opposite direction. I wouldn't have even gone home. I would have taken everything I've had and set up a new life for me. But, but I'm going to show him. I'm going to show him by giving him 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milk camels in their colts, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 foals. I don't know how much that means. I don't know what that means or how much money it is, but it's a lot. It's a lot of stuff. You know, that, that, that would be the equivalent today of like having the guy pull up in the BMW and the Mercedes and the boats, you know, and being like, oh, there's the first drove. And the second guy comes with like, you know, you know jewelry and nice things and, 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 and wave runners, you know, that, that's, that's how this would look. It's really expensive stuff coming to him saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I'm sorry. You know, in our language, we have a term that we use. It's called talk is cheap. Don't we? You've, always, you've all heard that. Talk is cheap. Saying you're sorry is one thing, church. Showing your actions, trying to change something, is another. No one just needs empty talk. Jacob was ready to do what he could in his own power to set what was right. The problem today is apologies that we get from some people, they're, they're just that. 
they're just empty words. There's no action or heart behind it. There, there, there's nothing there. I, I've been counseling someone, and, and they've been asking me, and, and they've been talking to me, and they said, how do I know if this person has changed in my life? They keep saying they're sorry. They're, they're saying these words that I so desperately wanted to hear on their mouth years ago, but now they're finally saying it. How do I know? How do I know if it's real? I told them, I said, listen, you're going to know what's real by their life matching what they're saying. Their actions will change. They will look for repentance, not only from you, but the last they're sorry from everyone else that they have also hurt. And you will see by the life that they are living that they have changed. And if their actions can't match the words, there's no repentance in their heart. If you are genuinely sorry, yes, love believes all things, but if you're genuinely sorry and you genuinely are repentant, there will be actions that change that. And so Jacob offered this up for just in good faith and a plea, please forgive me, please forgive me, please forgive me. However, I find it just really ironic that he's willing to offer up everything except the one thing that he should have offered up, himself. He was willing to offer up all of his goods, everything that he had, his servants, whatever was needed, I will give to you, but I'm not going to show up myself to try to work things out with you. And can't we be the same with God? When I read that, it's convicting because we can be that way with God in our lives, church. We continue to offer God one thing at a time. Okay, God, well, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm gonna, I'll start going to church. That's what I'll do. That's what Christians do. I'll go to church. Are you happy now, God? Okay, well... I'm going to start tithing, and instead of tithing 10%, I'm going to tithe 11%. Aren't you proud of me now, God? I know you don't like me smoking, God, so I'm going to start, stop smoking. And we begin to give him wave after wave after wave of gifts, and all God's saying is, give me everything. Surrender yourself to me. Surrender who you are. Surrender your will to my life. And you're like, but how does like me eating less fast food sound to you? Like, and all the while, God wants you to surrender your life to him. Look at verses 22 through 27. This is an interesting part of scripture, church. It says here, and he arose that night, and he took his two wives and his two, uh, his two female servants, and he crossed over, uh, oh, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the fort of Javik. It says he took them, and he sent them over the brook, and sent them over to, uh, sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip went out of joint and, uh, as he wrestled with him. That is an amazing and strange part of scripture. There's no way around that. That is bizarre, okay? Let's talk about it for a second. So he sends his last group of people, and they've slowly been going over with all of his stuff. And now it's time for him to send his family over. He sends his wives, he sends his children, he sends them all over, and he's, and, he's, and he's sending them to the point of no return. You gotta understand, as they would cross the Jordan, he was basically completely surrendering it. Because if they were to be attacked, their back would be to the Jordan, they would have nowhere to flee. They would be completely decimated. So as he's sending them over one at a time, now he's left all alone. Can't God do his biggest work when we're alone? I'll tell you, you know, it, it is easy to be all about the ministry and be constantly busy in the Lord. And, and there's a lot of people that do that. There's a lot of people that want to just remain busy all the time because they never want to be alone with God. God loves you, man. But God also knows the things that are hurting you. And you don't want him to address those. And so you don't want that alone time. So you always try to keep yourself busy, but now there's nothing left to do. Everyone's gone. Jacob's by himself, and God is going to work the best when he got him alone. So now picture this. Everyone's been sent over. He knows he's completely alone, and a man comes up out of nowhere and begins to wrestle with him. No one? That's completely normal in your lives? 
To me, it's bizarre. I mean, I guess to you guys, it just happens on the daily. I don't know. Uh, it's funny, funny story as I was saying that in the first service. That's literally happened to someone in the last two weeks. Uh, so we have a Bible Institute kid, and they both, they both went down to Hollywood. And as they went down there, uh, one of them's name's Joseph, the other one's name's Jed, and they brought some of the other girls from CBI, and they're all going to the beach and having a good time or whatever. And so as they were going, there was this really shady-looking character, right? And so uh, Gerald had been teaching, you know, well, whenever there's anyone shady or any of these things, you got to make sure that you, men, you're willing to stand up for, for the women. You know, you got to stand. And so Jacob's like, not, so Joseph's always telling the story. He's always like, so I was like this. I was like, what's going on? You know, because the guy's walking by, so I'm going like this. And as the guy walked by, the biggest kid probably in CBI, the one kid I wouldn't swing on uh, is the one that gets swung on by this, this, this homeless guy or this, this shady looking character. And as he walks by, the guy just goes and swings and misses and then kind of stumbles over. And, and J- Joseph goes, did you see that guy just swung at you? And he's like, what? What just happened? And like didn't even realize, but he, he, tried to, he tried to punch him, but he was just so out of it that he couldn't reach him. But he was like, that actually happened to me not too long ago. A guy approached me and tried to wrestle me and, and it didn't work. I was like, well, then it's not that weird of a story for you. But for everyone else, we're kind of sitting there going like, what is happening? And I want you to notice something else that's kind of weird, and I want you to understand it in the, in the word too, because it wasn't Jacob just started wrestling with this guy. This guy went up ready to wrestle, right? This man. But I want you to notice something else about the man, that the word man is capitalized, the letter M, because this is not a regular man. This is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. This is God in the flesh. Jesus comes and wrestles with Jacob. Now that just makes it even weirder to me, right? Pretty awesome though. Pretty awesome. The story just got very, very interesting, right? And you're like, why did he come and wrestle with Jacob? Why? Because God wanted every part of Jacob. God wanted his scheming. God wanted his heel catching. God wanted his planning by himself. God wanted his self-reliance. God wanted every single thing that he had. And God was physically willing to wrestle it out of him. You know, I think it was awesome because earlier we saw, we saw Jacob seeing the encampment of angels, God allowing him to see that physically. And now Jacob can physically see Jesus just whooping him, right? And I, and I love this, because as, as, J, as Jesus <laughs> wrestled with Jacob, he realized that Jacob wasn't going to give up. Like, Jacob was going. I mean, this is going on for a while. And, and it almost seems like, it, almost seems like it, it looked like it was competitive for a second, right? And then Jesus, like, dink, touches him. Touches him and dislocates his hip. At that point, you would know, hey, listen, I'm messing with something else otherworldly. There's something going on. He touched my hip, dislocated my hip. I'm in all sorts of pain now. But you know what? I want you to know that this is where everything began to change. At that point where he touched him and his hip dislocated, look what happens at this point in verse 26. Everything changed. And he said, let me go, that's Jesus, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, what, uh, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is, uh, <clears throat> which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. Do you understand that at first it was God wrestling with Jacob? And then by the end, Jacob is wrestling with God because he understands It was God. It was something else. Jacob refused to give up. Even with the pain and the stuff that was going on with Jacob with having a hip out of place and he's refusing to give up and he's saying, bless me. Bless me. 
And what was that blessing, right? He changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And we know in the Bible times, it is massive what your name is. It's, it's what you, it represents who you are, what you're going to be, or whatever. And I, and I love that Jesus asks him and goes, what's your name? Like Jesus didn't know, you know? He goes, what's your name? And he goes, my name is Jacob. My name is Trickster. My name is Heel Catcher. I'm a deceiver. Um, I stole from my brother. Basically, my name is everything I hate, Jesus. My name is everything I hate. And Jesus says to him, you're no longer going to be called Jacob. No more. That's not who you are. You're now going to be called Israel, which means God prevails. Man, that wrestling that he did with God physically and spiritually changed Jacob's life forever. He would continually have to rely on God as he walked with a limp for his life. But he also understood that God was in control completely of everything that he did, that God preserved him. And tonight, I, I, I honestly believe that there are many of you that walked in here with a lot of problems. There's a lot of you that walked in in the same state that maybe Jacob was in. Maybe you're in fear for your life. Maybe you're in fear of the future. Maybe there's something that is just really hindering who you are. Something that you've definitely done to yourself. And you've tried everything in your power to fix it, man. You've given every good shot that you've had. You've given every good thing except for the one thing that is needed, and that is the surrendering of yourself to say, I can't do it. To say, my name has to have the word, God prevails after it. I can't do it on my own. Maybe you've tried to quit doing a drug. Maybe you've cry tried to quit doing something else. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. And maybe you've been wrestling with God, as you know, as you know the whole time you're wrestling with him, that there's a door, there's a room, there's a closet, there's a fear, there's a depression, there's an addiction, there's a shame, and there's something you just don't want to give to him. You'll give him everything else except for that one closet that's in your heart. I'll give you everything, and the Lord's like, no, I'm wrestling with you. I want that one thing that you refuse to give me. I want all of you. And maybe you're holding on to the old you, and you're like, my name is liar. My name is the past. My name is adulterer. My name is cheater. My name is addict. My name's abuser. My name's abused. My name's the victim. My name's the one that has done everything wrong my whole life. And Jesus is saying, no. I can make you whole. I can make you, God prevails. I can do great things, but you've got to surrender yourself. You can't carry on anymore. You can't do this by yourself. You can't give almost everything and not give me that last piece of you. Listen, when you give your heart over to the Lord, God prevails over every single shortcoming you've ever had or ever will commit. And I want to give you the chance as I invite the worship team back up here to have that victory in your life tonight. Do you want to have that victory in your life tonight? Like I said at the beginning of the message, I don't understand why anyone would want to hold on to the burden. Why anyone would want to hold on to the terror and the fear that keeps them up at night. God is going to get his way. He's already wrestling with you now. You know he's wrestling in your heart right now. You can feel it. There's a part of you that he, you know he wants. And right now you're wrestling with him. Listen, don't make God come down here and physically wrestle it out of you, right? God's not going to give up. He loves you. And so what we're going to do is we're going to dim the lights. And I just want to give everyone a chance in here. I'm going to ask all heads bowed, eyes closed. And I'm going to ask, if you want to accept the Lord, if you're done being who you were and you want to be a new creature in Christ, a new creation, if you want to live in victory and no longer live in fear, you want to live in victory and no longer in shame, I want to encourage you to raise your hand tonight. 
Amen. 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 See you. If that's you in here tonight, I want to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. And there's a lot of believers in here that have already said that prayer and have already come to that surrender. But I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, believers, if the Lord has been working in your heart tonight and he's speaking to you about anything, a shame, condemnation, a fear, anything that is not of him and you've had a hard time giving it up, if you want to give it up tonight and move on, if you want to give it over and say, Lord, I can't wrestle with this anymore. I just need to surrender it to you. I can't fix it, Lord. I'm praying you can fix it. If you have something in your heart that you want to give to the Lord tonight, as a believer, raise your hand. Amen. You're all over the place. Be included. So let's pray. And I'll give you a chance to, let's first repeat after me and let's, let's um, believers, let's repeat this prayer with the people that want to accept the Lord for the first time. Repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I do believe that you are the Messiah, that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose again, that I might live. Lord Jesus, fill me full of your Holy Spirit and let me live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask every hand that wanted something taken away, something that they wanted to surrender something in their heart, a fear, a shame, whatever it is, <clears throat> an, an addiction, whatever, that they would raise their hand high. I'd ask you to do it again. I'm going to ask you to keep it up through the whole prayer and let's surrender it to the Lord tonight. Dear Lord, we love you and we thank you. Lord, we're your people and Lord, you know us, you know us intimately and you know that thing that we have in our heart, Lord God, that you've been wanting for a long time. Lord, we want to live in victory. Lord, we want to walk and go where you tell us to go. Lord, we don't want to fear what is waiting there for us. We want to move just at the the, just the sound of your voice. So, Lord, whatever we're giving to you right now, every hand that is raised, whatever they're giving to you, Lord, would you take that from them? Lord, it's their heart to yours, Lord God, and you're asking to surrender it and they're saying so Lord Jesus take it from them let them walk in freedom and victory tonight let the enemy have no hold over their life in Jesus name amen